Hey everyone, hope you're having a great weekend. It is Sunday. And uh, last week we had a few issues with getting pictures so that they were large enough for the viewing audience to uh, be able to enjoy. And I felt like the overall content would be um, less than suitable and acceptable for uh, David Levitt and being able to uh, tell his story. We'd like to thank him for taking the time second weekend in a row that we've uh, embarked on his time. And uh, uh, thank you again for allowing us to do that. Congrats again to all the weight pool winners last weekend in Kansas, as well as the uh, winners from the Carolina Spectacular. And uh, without further ado, we're going to get into this. And uh, David, uh, let's just go ahead and start off again with your background growing up in animals. Hi, everybody. Thank you for your interest. Um, grew up on a farm in Pennsylvania before ticks, uh, where we could run in the woods and not get in any trouble, uh, at least with the bugs. And uh, started out as a farm farm and then became a standard bred racehorse breeding farm that turned out 200 yearlings a year. Uh, grew up with horses. And, uh, you know, that was my background. And uh, you know, I got my first dog when I was 20, an English bulldog, and that's what set me on the path to doing what I've done in dogs. Absolutely. Going back to the history of the bulldog, uh, you were drawn to the Regency uh, period bull baiter. And uh, can you just take us through the history of the bulldog? So... Something about the overmatched underdog, a, a bulldog against a, a powerful bull attracted me to, to the story. And uh, when, the, when the Romans came to Britain in, in 50 AD, there were dogs there then used for the amphitheater and for hunt and for war. And uh, you know, they're, they're mentioned in literature right on through with the Romans. And uh, after they left in 400, uh, around 1,000, the Normans came in and they were already baiting, baiting animals with dogs. And uh, baiting was a royal sport from 1550 to 1650, roughly. And uh, it fell out of favor with, with the royals in uh, 1685. And... Uh, they started tethering the bull. Before that, the bull was loose and the dogs were bigger, uh, probably 100, 120 pounds, and would actually throw the bull. And later, when it became uh, uh, no longer a royal sport, it was easier for common people to keep a smaller dog. And they started tethering the bull with a collar and, and a line and an anchor. And uh, the dogs were bred smaller and and uh, the object was to pin the bull, to, to have the bull finally put the dog down, and that's when the dog had won. Uh, so it was from 1685 to 1835, uh, bull baiting went that way. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we had talked briefly, and of course, there's the theory of pug being added to bring down the size, make the dogs a little more uh, handler friendly, uh, post bull baiting. And you said that that is something that you do not subscribe to, correct? I, I couldn't find any uh, anything uh, to back that up. And when you look at the art showing the pug of the period, they weren't they weren't super short nose. They didn't have jowls. You know, they had a nose and they had a club tail. And uh, you know, I I just don't. I think it was selective breeding that they bred them wider and, and shorter nose until you have what you have today. You know, when I, when I had my, when I got into bulldogs in the, in the early seventies, um, they weren't so fat and they could still run. And, uh, and in the next five years or so, uh, to win in the show ring, they had to be so fat that the, their back jiggled. And, you know, literally, if, if, if they weren't that fat, they couldn't win in the AKC show ring. So, uh, 
you know, bull mastiffs at the time too. I remember a bull ma AKC bull mastiff show guy who had had uh, guard dogs, and uh, within ten or fifteen years, they would have thrown him out of the club. Uh, the bull mastiff people would not have allowed their dogs to be used for work anymore. Yeah, aesthetics are a very interesting thing, and of course we. Uh, have seen several breeds with the AKC go downhill from the uh, dogs that are in the field and working to the dogs that are winning in the show ring. And uh, it comes down to selective breeding. And uh, we just all have to be very vigilant in what we're doing and pay attention so that uh, we don't follow that same course. And uh, now one thing about David, as you can see, this is a room in his house behind him. You can just see the amount of art, memorabilia, historical prints, everything. And we are so lucky that we are going to go through many of these today uh, through the pictures that uh, he's uh, allowed me to have for this uh, live session today. And also he's going to be able later to take a camera around and kind of show us some different things as well. So this is truly a treat and uh, that many of us are going to be able to experience today that otherwise it just hasn't been afforded to others. And so thank you for doing that for us. Now I'm gonna go ahead and go to the share screen and go to the function that was not allowing us to work last week. Here we got young David Levitt. And uh, this is a dog, is this dog named Tweed? Yes. Beautiful, beautiful uh, bulldog. And you said he was pretty much the uh, vision that you had, correct? He was perfect. He and Rose, I, after 24 years, I'd finally achieved what I wanted, uh, a little more leg than my early ones, and a very nice temperament and wonderful dog. Right. David is rocking a major mustache here. Looks great. He's uh, young and buff and lean and hard. You got veins popping out of his arms here. And uh, so it looked like a good time. Um, now we're going to start going through some of these uh, – prints and the different paintings and just memorabilia that David has here. So as we scroll through, David's just going to tell us about them. So Troy, look at this. This Billy killing 4,000 rats in seven hours. I can just see these English guys running with more rats, you know, throwing them in. And the rats had to be dead, you know, they couldn't be kicking. So th this dog went through 4,000 rats. He was probably the greatest ratter of all time. And he actually, the, the, the fellow had him in the hotel room and there was a rat in the cage. And, uh, and Billy had a nervous fit because he couldn't get it. And the guy came back from dinner, the dog was dying and died in his arms and, you know, frustration, I guess. But uh, yeah, rat pits and badger drawing and uh, dog fighting and you know it was it was not a good thing and it was cruel but you know through through the baiting years you have to look at uh the english did witch hunts but not as much as on the continent and some some cities in in europe a third of the population was killed in witch hunts in horrible ways so you know they were torturing animals, but it wasn't people. It's not a, a lot positive you can say about that, but uh, something about the staying power for me as a young man, the, 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 the commitment and uh, willing to, to hang in at any cost attracted me. And uh, all these dogs had it. Absolutely. And uh, I still see on Facebook, several people from the UK, Scotland, Ireland, doing their barn hunts, doing ratting, uh, and it's unbelievable the numbers that they're pulling out of there with the uh, with their animals. Another uh, print here. So that's Lancier, and some of these you have to worry that uh, uh, that the artist is taking liberties with the dogs. And um, Lancier was pretty much the most famous painter of, of animal paintings during this period. This one's 1820. And you can be pretty sure that's, that's what the dog looked like. And he liked bulldogs. Yes. So early bulldog, 
you know, shown by different artists and with different things going on behind him. I've, I've got uh, art showing this with a bull bait in the back. Uh, this is French, but you know, it's the same dog they're using. So that's Alkin. Alkin did a lot of sporting prints. Uh, this one's called A Few Real Fanciers. It's the bull broke loose, the rope broke, and uh, bull got the first guy and on to the second. And uh, sometimes he showed these long nosed dogs, like this one, looks like a standard AB, uh, maybe a little more undershot, but you know, interesting, nice bull. Looks blue. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> just so that's my earliest uh, 1600s interesting dog, you know, short tail, bully head. Found that in, in Amsterdam and Holland. Okay. Uh, Chaco Macaco, Westminster Pit, you know. Three, three wins as a champion for a, a fighting dog today. This monkey, I don't know how many wins it had, 28, 30 against, uh, against worthy opponents. And sometime they gave, sometimes they gave him a club. And as quick as the dogs were, he'd be on their back hitting them with a the club. Yeah, nobody's seen this one. It's 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 real small. I'm sorry, it's a bad quality picture, but it's a nice dog. Right. <clears throat> Again, more terrier influence, smaller feet, whip tail, bully head, clearly athletic, roach back. Another dog with leg and clearly able to move. Nice tail. Mm -hmm. You know, bigger, heavier dog. Yeah, I mean, you're seeing the variation here. It's, it's, it's going through those three, you can see the range of them and with, with most of the standards, there's enough leeway that you can really breed to the standard with all three of these dogs. So this is an animal rights track from the late 1700s. They're very interesting. They, it was back and forth for years trying to outlaw animal fighting. And you know this is a, a, a period propaganda track to, to stop it. You know, bull baiting was still legal then too, so that would that would have got stopped. Okay, so this is interesting. I, I'm sorry it's small for you, but this uh, see this bull bait going on down below. And if you look to the left of the bull, see the guy with the red pants. There's a dog stuck on his calf, and to the right of him is a guy with a blue coat that's consoling him. And uh, to the right of him, he's getting his pocket picked by the next guy losing his wallet but uh, you know fun art and uh, dog in the air owner trying to catch him sometime somehow they broke their the dog's fall with a bamboo pole and I can't I can't picture it I can't imagine how they did it there's I've never seen any art showing it being done usually you know it's somebody trying to catch the dog um, you know, again, I, I, I can't imagine, but I, you know, it's written that they broke their fall with a, a bamboo pole. Again, I can't believe they swatted them out of the air and made them go sideways. But. Right, very interesting. That's something new that I've never heard before as well. And uh... so this is a newspaper account of the lion bait. Uh, the first lion was not real aggressive and didn't want any part of it. And dog actually pinned him. This is the previous photo that we have shown before. It's photo, It's in a frame, and um, I didn't know if this had any other purpose, this photo here. No. No. Okay, so this is little. This is uh, three quarters of an inch across, uh, porcelain, sort of fun. 
Now, I wish the nose was black instead of red nose, but you know, that's the way the artist did it. That's a stick pin, again, small porcelain. So this is a second version of this. The, uh, it's a little bit smaller than the earlier ones and the earlier ones are $10,000 more. Uh, this one's 10 or 15 years later and, and smaller, but uh, no, no, that's what I got. Again, that shows you the size of the pin. So, you know, a lot of these pieces, other breeds can claim them. You know, I like to think it's a bulldog, but uh, Valton was French, just could have been a dog of Bordeaux. It's got a club tail, real nice head. Uh, these came in three sizes. This one's about uh, 14 inches tall. I, I saw one that was pretty much life size once in New York, same piece. And two artists did the same dog in the same position. Valton shows him a little bullier, a little wider head. So this is a Valton, he's the artist. Humidors. Nice. Tobacco one in these, the top comes off. Award. Those are little pins. You know, the one on the right could be a pit bull. You know, again, I'll claim it as a bulldog. So that's pretty much life-size humidor. Uh, the first time I saw it, I didn't have the money to buy it. And uh, I, I found it at, a, at an antique show later, pretty much life-size. And I don't know if you have where it opens up. You got the next one that opens up now. So oh, no, I didn't. Opens up. That's okay. When it when I take the camera around, I can show you the top opens up and has a place for ashes in the front and a match holder. You know, again, more underbite than I'd like and cut ears, but a bulldog. These right. are ivory. The one on the right's a riding crop, and the one on the left is a cane. Collar. Awards, late 1800s. Dog this is just awards. the back side of them here, I believe. Yep. Yeah, two, two more collars. Now we have some paintings here. Yeah, watercolor, nice dog, you know, nice nose, leg. It's a famous one, Billy and Rosa. Mm -hmm. Another nice dog. Wow, those are rats behind it. Yeah, I, I like saw that. that. It's got a. I, I never yeah, noticed those rats, rats behind it until now in this picture and looking at it. But we have one, two, three, a couple rats back there. Loader painting. I don't know if the dog on the right really had that nose. And you see it once in a great while with American bulldogs. I don't really like that turn up, but uh, you know, it may not have been that way. The dog sure. on the left doesn't have it. So that's a primitive painting from England. That's Town. He was a Royal Academy painter, um, real well known. And, you know, it's the first, first blue dog that I've seen. And uh, you can see it's 1808. 
So this was probably a working bulldog and it was blue with a short tail. This, so, you know, interesting dog. And, you know, it's an argument that you could allow blue dogs, which I haven't. But. Right. So this one, this was a painting that got sold to a decorator and probably didn't go to a dog person, but a really nice dog. And, you know, burnt toast. So the color didn't come through, but the color was burnt toast, dark dog, and really nice head. Probably an early Boston Bull. They were originally a fighting dog. And I think that's what that was. And then we get into some old photographs here. That's probably a pit bull, the tea party, a lot of fun. And some of these pit bulls are undershot. I mean, here's a, this is an interesting one, a pioneer woman. Uh, you know, a lot of breeds could claim these dogs, but the front one clearly looks undershot to me. And, you know, is it a bulldog? Is it a pit bull? It's hard to say, but, you know, interesting. That's a, that's a big piece. It's, uh, you know, 30 inches tall, probably. Another early picture, probably a pit bull, but nice dog. All my right. My first bulldog. Yes. So that was my first bulldog right there. And uh, that was a Yale bulldog. And this is the first Yale bulldog mascot handsome Dan and they got him stuffed that's the second one already more extreme right so right it, is this Yale's, a Yale's, Yale's mascot their last mascot is an old English bulldog not an English bulldog. They've got one now from a from one of the few people that hell screams before breeding. Um, wicked good bulldogs from New England, and uh, that's the Yale bulldog mascot. You know, there's George's. George is not changing yet, but you know they had one die at two years old and uh, pathetic, very sad, and uh, you know whatever it takes they, they got to get healthier dogs interesting i didn't know that now i'm gonna have to check out this new yale mascot uh later on and uh so we'll get to uh that next uh picture here br briefly but um with uh that is just uh some of the memorabilia you have do you want to share some of the other memorabilia in the room now or do you want to do that later on uh, let's let's do it at the end. Perfect, perfect. And uh, so, while the camera um, set up, as you talked about, as we were going through some of the different prints, you were talking about that bulldog size is buried, and it seemed like uh, during different periods, due to changes in the way baits were staged, etc. Um, you know, distinctive heads, bodies, and temperaments that were dictated for their work. Anything you'd like to expand on that? I mean, that's the basic thing. When the, when the bull was running loose uh, and, and the dogs had to stop him, you needed a bigger dog. I can't imagine the damage that was done through the towns. I, don't, I never heard of them being in a fenced area. They, they must have, at the end of it, been in a fenced area, but I never saw art showing that. And uh, once they had the bull anchored in one place, the big dogs probably were bigger target for one thing and uh i don't think they were quite as quick as a smaller dog i know with men it's hard to have a, a big man as as quick as a little man uh, they hit harder but you know may not be as agile so probably same for dogs and uh you know i was drawn to the smaller ones and uh you know I didn't really need this project 
I just wanted a dog. And uh, I started with my English Bulldog. And uh, when I found out that's not the way the original dog looked and saw Art showing the original dog, that, that's what I wanted. Yes, you have a very well-written standard that you had put together for your dogs. I saw one for the old English Bulldog and then another one for your uh, Levitt Bulldogs. And it talks about the sizes and the reasons for it. We can discuss that later. But size because of the horns of the bull as well as size or too much weight um, where you didn't want it to rip the bull's nose um, with, with being whipped. And uh, we'll discuss that. But Again, you were talking about the variance in Bulldogs, and it isn't just today. We see a wide variance in Bulldogs today, from standard dogs to classic types within, and within those two different uh, classifications. But um, we still see it, especially in the Old English Bulldog and, and other breeds as well. And uh, so you had these breeding goals and aspirations. You said that you had the English Bulldog, you learned later about these bull baiters and you wanted something that was a little more dog or a little more capable than what you had. And that led you to want to do the breed back. You kind of called it a breed back. And this was around the 1970, 1971 period. Yes, I got my Bulldog in 1970. And uh, his body just didn't live up to his spirit. He was a great dog and, you know, had a lot of drive and would run until he fell over and wouldn't learn that he couldn't swim. I had to save him from drowning three times. And, uh, you know, he was a great friend and good character. And uh, so, you know, it was based on him. And, uh, you know, I, I got the complete English Bulldog written by Colonel Bailey Haynes, and it showed the art. And, uh, you know, I, I, again, I would have rather just gone and bought a dog that looked like that and uh, no place to get one. And uh, so I started the project of breeding back. Exactly. And as you said, you couldn't find a reliable source for these old style Bulldogs. And so it led you to just creating them yourselves. And so what breeds made up the Old English Bulldog or your Levitt Bulldogs? We'll also so, discuss your uh, foundation dogs here as we go through that. So I looked all over, you know, I wanted to find examples of the old dog. And, and uh, there was a Bulldog in Majorca and it had gone extinct you know, 10 years before probably. And uh, there were reports of old dogs in Nova Scotia. And, uh, you know, that turned out to be a lie, you know, an outright lie. And uh, so uh, I used half English Bulldog and uh, the other half was Pitbull, Bull Mastiff and American Bulldog, each one sixth. So, so that was my that was the female I used, Lucy. She was bred for hog hunting in California where they had big hogs, they had big hogs in. And uh, she was half pit bull and half bull mastiff. Uh, she was a great dog, smart, sensitive, trainable. She was very animal aggressive. Uh, and she, she threw that in the next generation. And it's interesting, you know, you never know what you're gonna get when you breed. And some dogs are just prepotent. And uh, my, my first generation, I was lucky and they came out pretty much between the bulldog and this one. I've had other breedings that took after one or the other of the parents. And uh, uh, you know, it's just something you have to try. And sometimes it takes longer to get them the way you want them. But uh, you know, they're, that first generation from these two were at a, a you know, had some of them had aggression and, uh, you know, some of them were a handful. You know, I had one that it attacked a bulldozer, broke a cable, stainless steel cable and attacked the bulldozer and all four feet off the ground and was moving along with the track when the operator saw the dog before it came around the corner and, you know, ran over its head. And that dog was, uh, was not a good pet. Um, nope. You know, I had Those... another one that caught a horse, horse by the nose with a rider on the back. And uh, 
through the rider and horse ran off with the dog on its nose and the owner got in his truck and followed him and eventually caught the horse and then he had the truck and he had the horse and he had the dog and he took the dog and put it in the truck left his truck and rode the horse home and uh, you know so yes that so was the were, first generation quite a bit of dog with this first generation did you notice that there were uh did you get a lot of color or did you get fides? What what was the dogs marked up like? A, a lot of brindle, mostly brindle. Okay. Brindle and white. And then the, the next generation was, his kennel name was Jigs. Um, he was an 80 pound bulldog, bought to be a champion by a friend of mine that had show dogs. And he just kept growing he, at 80 pounds. He was too big. And he went to a, a Catholic school for, for delinquent boys and ran with the track team. He was very much healthier than he looked. And uh, so it, it, back it up one. I'm trying to find Jigs right now. Is this Jigs? No. Uh, this was a dog in the second scheme. Now he got to go the other way. There you go. I'm just uh, waiting and I'm sorry because there's a little bit of a delay between me and you here. And uh, so I'm trying to remember back on the pictures, um, which was uh, Jigs. But we'll just go in the order. We'll go in the order that the pictures are in the uh, presentation here. Um, we had looked at the uh, we had looked at the uh, foundation dogs, and you thought that they were all in there. And so we'll go back here. Um, we had your original. We had your bull mastiff uh, American. There he is. There you got it. You got it now, Troy. That's Jigs. So. Uh, Again, we're kind of uh, fumbling around here a little bit. And uh, so I think this is Jigs. I'm just going to leave it here until David uh, confirms that. OK, so that's uh, Mugs. That was the, the second scheme. The, the first scheme was the one you just saw, it was the, the Bulldog and the Pitbull Bull Mastiff and, and the Bulldog and, uh, and Pepper Pot of Alan Scott, that nice American Bulldog, uh, not extreme. I don't think it, the dog was inbred. You know, I was very happy to use that one. And then this is the second scheme. Uh, I started two, two schemes so that when I got down, and yeah, that's, uh, that's Pepper Pot of Alan Scott. Very yep. nice dog. Um, and that, that was my whole first scheme. And I've got a diagram that, that you'll see how I, I ran with it. It was a cattle breeding scheme and uh, you line bred every generation. So I started a second scheme so that I would have an outcross before they got too inbred. I actually started four schemes and uh, you know I dropped two of them because of genetic problems. Even without them being inbred, uh, genetic problems would come out. Okay, so that's this, this is the second scheme, the bulldog you just showed, and this was a pit bull, uh, not a good picture of her. She, her brother was the, uh, the world's biggest, his claim was the world's biggest pit bull at the time, Captain Crunch from New Hampshire, 120 pounds, beautiful dog, and, you know, notorious Red Connors was the owner. So at least this, his sister, Michelle, and uh, that's how we started the second scheme. And this is one that the puppies of those two all took after the mother. And, you know, it took longer to get them looking right. So th this, was, this was the best bulldog I ever used. Uh, Tracy's Max, he was, had energy, you know, was not overdone for the time and uh, was a great dog. And I bred him with a bull mastiff. And again, the, their puppies took after the bull mastiff more. 
Again, it, it took time. So those were, again, I'm shooting for the same ratio of breeds, half Bulldog and the other half Pit Bull, Bull Mastiff, American Bulldog. I just got it differently. So up to this point, we got two thirds of the dog in there. And then uh, the, next, the next foundation was uh, again, Jigs and bred to Johnson's Georgia girl. All right, we called uh, Georgie. Dave, so we've got this uh, scheme, this, this, this scheme up now. So this is a vertical pedigree. You know, to show it horizontal was much harder because the dogs were closely bred. So, you know, I'm proud of this. This is something I worked up. And the three foundation dogs go across the top, the males on either side and the females down the middle. So you bred the first two. And again, down the middle drops a female. To the right is, uh, is the unrelated male is bred in to the right over here. And, uh, and then females from that drop down to the next generation in the middle and they get bred to an uncle. And every generation, the females get bred to an uncle. Very so nice. They're, they're not bred back to the father, but they're bred to their uncle. And, uh, you know, after five generations, I started getting worried about them being closely bred and, uh, you know, I've got a diagram that, you know, when we're finished, I'll, I'll post some links on, uh, on Troy, Troy's Facebook so you can look at some things. Um, I've got a, a diagram showing the results of inbreeding and very interesting that when you breed close, the dogs become ho more homozygous in temperament and looks, but what you get is polygenetic disorders like cancer, epilepsy, and immune problems. And you get inbreeding depression, uh, fertility, litter size, pup mortality, and lifespan. And uh, really the only thing positive you get is that they they look right, they look the same, and they, they hopefully act the same. But, uh, you know, what, what the new breeding is ways to get diversity and how to get diversity in your inbred lines. And uh, I've got a couple of organizations that are doing amazing work and I'll put links up uh, after we finish this so that those who are interested, if you're breeding dogs, I highly recommend going to both these sites and looking at it. Um, one of them has a free mini course, uh, that's betterbred.com, very interesting. And uh, so anyway, you know, that's, so, that's my, what I think of inbreeding. So one thing I read about your selection for the breeds of dogs that you included was that you only use breeds with old bulldog in their background. Is that correct? Yes. And I, I would have liked to have used Boxer, except they were so prone to cancer that you know, the, the University of Pennsylvania Pathology Lab had a boxer poster on the wall. They saw so many of them. So that's why I stayed away from boxer. In Europe, they have some nice heavier boxers and they use them for, they call it boar hunting there. But, uh, you know, at, at, a, at a Schutzen National here, I saw there were two European boxers here doing Schutzen. Uh, so... Now, um, I had to laugh, like, because you and I were talking, and you said that there was another breed of dog that you actually looked at, and because of old historical literature and stuff, and I think that you even had him come to your yard, um, maybe, but what, was there a time when you had contemplated about even the use of Greyhound? Yeah, you know, I, I had a, a dog rip a knee, and uh, I've had a couple of dogs rip knees and uh, I went to the University of Pennsylvania and Smith came out who developed pen hip with his you know, 28 students in the room. And I said, here's the dog, here's the x-ray. What in the confirmation is causing the dogs to rip their knees? And he said, we have a new way of x-raying hips and it shows laxity that wasn't shown with OFA. 
And, you know, I took a breath and I looked at all of them and I said, well, that's just more bad news. I don't want to know about that. Uh, you know, what in their confirmation causing them to rip their knees? He said, well, I, I can't tell you that, but we have a woman here, Bonnie Dalzell, and she's doing genetic research on, uh, on improving hips and knees. And it was before they had the genome and uh, she was breeding shepherds with, with sh horrible hips, with uh, borzois with perfect hips and knees. And uh, she was calling them shepzoids and looking at how, how the bad traits were inherited. So, you know, I talked to her and she said, well, you need Greyhound and you got to breed it in twice. And I'd struggled for many years by that time. And I'd seen luck, good luck and bad luck. And, you know, I was afraid that I was going to put another 15 years in before I got him looking right again. And, you know, I had the dog there and, uh, you know, I just couldn't go through with it. And, you know, now... Knees, knees, for those of you who are breeding and, you know, and owning dogs, uh, you know, there's part of these ripped knees may be the dog puppies getting antibiotics before they're 10 months old. You know, there's some studies on this and there are other things involved too, but it's causing dry tendons that rip and, uh, you know, Vets, I find, ha hand out much too much antibiotics when it's not called for, and people go away happy with them, and they screw up the dog's stomachs, and they may be screwing up more than the stomach. So I just want to point out, be careful, and, you know, ripped knees are a mess, and the rehab's a mess. Um, you know, I've, I've had dogs that came back 100% and could do spring pole afterwards, but I really shouldn't have done that. And... Um, so yeah, that's the Greyhound story. I'm glad you mentioned that. And uh, I did not know that about the antibiotics. So I find that very interesting and something that I need to go back and uh, do some research on myself just to uh, learn more about that. Um, now, last week we did go ahead and talk about the uh, old English Bulldog, um, the oldie. Um, and so let's briefly go through that again. So, you know, I created a line of dogs, a breed of dogs, and a breed is uh, originates with a uh, founder occurrence, all breeds, you know, like uh, Siberian Huskies are traced back to four dogs and all the breeds trace back to, to uh, a founder occasion. So I didn't create a type of dog, like a band dog, you know, uh, based on its size and looks. And, uh, you know, people thought it was a good idea. They may have seen my dog world ads. And, you know, I was, I had dogs winning at rare breed shows. Uh, so the next thing I know, I had people using my breed name for, for their dogs that weren't related. Uh, one of them in, in British Columbia threw some dogs with spinal bifida and, you know, a long way from what I wanted. And, uh, and Hermes used my name in the beginning. Um, so I lost the use of the name. And now there's a Facebook page with 19,000 people on it. And, you know, there might be three or four that hell scream before breeding. Mm -hmm. And when I judge an oldie class, it's weird that the dogs are straight stifled. And that's a real problem for me, you know. I, I, I can't, if a dog's got straight stifle, I see it right away and I can't see much else because that's a problem for me. You know, it's an unsound leg. And to see a whole class straight stifled, <laughs> scattered bred, not related, you know, it's really weird. But uh, there are some good dogs and uh, there's some dogs being worked and there's some weight pole dogs and, you know, some, some APA weight pullers and, uh, Evolution Bulldogs with, with Brian Miller, a smart right. guy, good dog man. And his dogs are, you know, they're bigger than I'd like and bullier, but they're healthy and, you know, amazing looking. Uh, the one I saw had wonderful temperament, did hardest hitting, weight pull, and was good with people, you know. So, uh, but out of 19,000, I should have more people that I could say, recommend and I'm always looking for new blood and everyone that I find that 
looks all right. They got blue dogs in them or they got red nose. They're things that, that I haven't allowed. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of constrained by my standard. My standard is, is pretty clear. It does have enough, uh, enough leeway that you can have a bullier dog and you can have a lighter dog. Uh, but, you know, compared to other standards, it's, it's got more detail than most and locks them in more than a lot. Uh, my original registry was called uh, the OEBA, Old English Bulldog Association. And uh, in the 90s, somebody starts the IOEBA, you know, and uh, I looked at trademarking the name and suing, but you had to do it in federal court and I wasn't willing to do it. And so when I had the chance, uh, breeders with my dogs, a, a number of them came with me and we started the Levitt Bulldog Association and, you know, wrote a standard and now I have a wonderful board of directors and I want to mention them because uh, for me, this is a dream come true. When I was breeding my dogs, I needed help and everybody, I set up breeding after a couple of years, they knew more than me and they wouldn't send me x-rays and they, they, they didn't want to know about x-rays and and health screening. So now I've got uh, Marie Carey Morris and Chris Blatcher in this country. Uh, I got Jessica Gilmore in England, uh, Barry and Cindy Shute in, in Holland. Um, I've got Arno Pettit in France and uh, Laura Hanuna in France and really, I'm just so lucky to have wonderful people involved that, that you know, can continue this and all of our breed decisions are made together as a board. Um, so, you know, I've got some wonderful breeder and I've got some dogs working and they're really proving themselves in their work and also in their home. You know, like I'm, I'm really proud of the ones competing, but, but Barry and Cindy to go out for a walk with their pack of dogs in a park in Amsterdam and run into another pack of dogs and have the dogs like say hello and then continue on and no fighting. Uh, for me, that's real success. And uh, you know, that really the truth of the matter is for our dogs today, you know, they prove themselves in the home and are they eating the house and killing the neighbor's cat and, and the chihuahua next door or are they an asset to the family and friendly and all right with the neighbor's kids playing in the yard with your kids and not stepping in and biting them. Uh, so, you know, that, that's where my dogs are now that they've continued to, to I've show the art and I don't micromanage the breeders. I ask for pictures before we approve them for breeding. And, um, you know, we have, have uh, non-breeding papers for dogs with disqualifications. But other than that, I'm, I'm not telling people, you know, your dog is ugly and it can't breed only if there's a major structural problem or uh, entropion or bad legs. Uh, so they've, con they've continued to improve and, you know, I'm really proud. It's all based on my breeders and the people involved now. Really, to do this successfully, you need more people. You need, you need a thousand dogs out there to have fresh blood. And, uh, you know, in the beginning, I didn't want loads of people involved. Uh, and it's hard to get a lot of good people. And uh, in this country, we're down to four breeders now. And if you're in dogs for a long time, you see people come and go. And the average person is, is in a breed for four or five years. So we have some that are, that are in it for well longer than that. So, uh, that, that's how my dogs are doing. You know, we've got a, a, a standard and we've got various levels of papers. Uh, we have breeding approval. Uh, I want to see x-rays of hips and elbows before we allow dogs to be bred. We've really been very lucky. Even with two different breeds, we've, I've had uh, genetic problems come out where there's zero inbreeding. And our dogs are bred pretty close and uh, we're always concerned and we've been lucky. When you look at the Doberman, I heard 65% of Dobermans have uh, degenerative myelopathy, that they'll be crippled at eight years old and drag their rear end. I mean, 
that can happen and all the established AKC breeds um, deal with one genetic problem after another and they have the problem of popular sire and it spreads. You know, luckily if it's recessive, you can, in one generation, you can breed it out if you test. We got dogs like Cavalier, King Chow, Spaniards where the brain outgrows the skull and there's a genetic test for it and they won't do it. You know, really stupid and cruel. Yeah, no. So just taking it back just for a second. So in the seventies, you come out with the old English bulldog and it was uh, dogs that you created, that you named, and people got away from that and started using dogs uh, from outside of the foundation stock. And there became a huge variance in type and health and people weren't on board with the uh, health checks that you wanted, such as hips and, and things. And um, you said that the OEB uh, became a type of dog and no longer a breed. And you went on to create the Levitt Bulldog Association. And with that, um, you said that um, you get breeding approval. It was not meant to micromanage breeders. Um, you talk about different levels of paper and a clear, complete standard and a framework for the future. And I don't know if anybody has ever taken the time to go to the site and actually see uh, these dogs, but they are, um, or, or see the site that he has put up. I gotta see if I can even make it happen here myself. Um, and uh, hold on just a second, because I wanna bring this up and, and show people. Um, Troy, while you're doing that, let yes. me mention a few people. Yes, let's do it. So, uh, Laura used to live in Switzerland. She's in France now. Uh, excellent trainer, wonderful on dog care. Um, she had a dog working in bed bug detection, and she's competed in a number of sports and does therapy work with her dog. Jan Pettit in France is competing in Canacross. Uh, Simon Hayes in London has got a dog that can go 25 miles an hour for 200 yards and they run every day of the week. Um, we've got weight pull titles in Norway and France and a dog here pulled 7,150 pounds. Uh, uh, and uh, Jerome Goyer in France mushes. He's got this all-terrain two-wheel scooter and he hooks up to four dogs to it. And it's wonderful. We had trails, we can do it. And let me tell you, if the dogs aren't trained, you're face down in the dirt uh, with road rash. So, uh, you know, I love seeing the dogs being able to run. You know, I mentioned the, the shoots in Holland and their pack control. Um, Isabel Duthin, uh, Jerome Wooters and uh, Darren Moody, all doing great work with their dogs training. You know, it pains me, but I can't show protection work and I don't want protection work done because of breed specific legislation in Europe and also various places here in this country. And uh, they'll use the protection pictures against us. I had a family in Germany that, uh, that had enforcement done on them. And the dogs had never had one problem in the neighborhood, not a problem with a dog, not a problem with a person. Dogs all had very nice friendly temperaments. He had to leave the state with his dogs and the wife and the children stayed. And it took, it took months before it went through court and he could come back. And even after his dogs were allowed, uh, it didn't set a precedent for the state for the breed. Uh, so, you know, it's a real worry and American Bulldogs face this and uh, they're allowed in France. They're not allowed in England, Ireland, they're not allowed. Uh, I think there's a problem in Germany. Some of these countries, if you're with an established club, you can do protection work and you can protect your breed, but without the shelter of a state registered club, the dogs are at risk. So. We're doing other sports and uh, a lot of people here don't know about this probably, GRC dog sports. J. Jack is a, a, a dog trainer and a martial artist in Portland, Maine. And he's developed the sport and clubs 
Um, he's a uh, loves pit bulls and they compete in weight pull, wall climb, spring pull, and treadmill race. And before you compete in those, you have to pass a social responsibility test, which is super hard. One of my breeders still, I don't think she's passed that and hasn't gone on to the others. And with the spring pole, it's it's set up for control, you know, showing off the out. So, you know, there, there are other plenty of things you can do without without biting sports. Uh, so, yeah, go ahead. So the, All right. these are some yeah. of the some of the dogs, you know, uh, a big failing of, of bully dogs is is stamina and uh, you know long soundness and longevity. So you know that's why I like seeing these running sports that the dogs can do it it's, that still have the the wind to do it and still have the legs to do it and 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 the uh, and the body to to push it out there. So. Uh, you know, we, we've got more leg than my earlier dogs and, you know, again, matching the old artwork. And I, I've shown, tried to show the breeders the art and then they've gone back and it's, it's all on them. The success is all on them. Now, going uh, ahead, as we look at some of these pictures here of the dogs, you developed a standard. And I can't imagine the daunting task of developing a standard so that you don't have a wide variance. So it's very clear and uh, concise and comprehensive in a way that the Levitt Bulldog looks like no other uh, dog. And um, when developing the standard, there's, these were some key things that I took out of it was muscular, medium-sized dog, great strength, stability, and athleticism, well-balanced with great proportions, no exaggerated features, appearance of a dog capable of doing the original vocation of bull baiting. Uh, you talked about the height was low to avoid bull's horns. Males are 17 to 20 inches, 60 to 80 pounds. Uh, females were 16 to 19 inches, 50 to 70 pounds. And also weight, um, their weights were chosen to prevent from ripping the bull's nose. Um, another key thing that I, I uh, was reading was about the temperament. And you mentioned that you didn't want the temperament of the original bulldog. And you said, if I have to make a mistake, it must be on the friendly side. And if someone wants their dog to be sharper, all it takes is a bit of training. I'd rather teach a friendly dog to bite than vice versa. Anything to say about that? I think it's real important today. Uh, people are really soft and, and, you know, I love training and, you know, I've run into this purely positive business. People are soft and, you know, the dogs, you know, and, and also dogs can get you in real trouble. You know, you can lose your house over your dog messing up. And uh, so I think it's friendly and, I think friendly is important. And again, um, I think for somebody who wants to do protection that, that they can teach the dog and bring them along. Um, at the highest level, maybe a problem. You know, you may want a dog like a Malinois that the, the, the litters will all be stuck on your pant legs and uh, rip the clothes off you sometimes uh, if they're not handled right. And maybe you need that at the highest level. Um, but I think for, for most people and, and for most protection, you know, I would still like to start with a, with a friendly dog and then teach them to, to teach them aggression when called for. You talk about disposition. You want them to be confident, courageous, alert, friendly, loving, extremely strong. You say they may have same sex aggression. And a fault would be a shyness in a mature dog, not in a puppy, but a mature dog. Um, and then you talk about temperament, not overly aggressive. And again, it, you explain why, and it's just because you can't rely on the buyers to have their dogs under control. Um, as we go through here and just going down through the standard as well, you talk about the back and you say it is wide and muscular showing power. Top line has a slight roach or wheel back. There's a fall in the back to its low spot behind the shoulders. 
From this point, the spine rises to the loin. The high point of the loin is a little bit higher than the shoulders. And then there's a gentle curve forming an arch down to the tail. Um, the loin is muscular, medium in length, and slightly arched. Now, when looking at these pictures here, can you kind of just take us through that a little bit or tell us the, your thought I mean, behind no, that? Was it due to the historical pictures? Yes, it was. And, and the, the one just before this, this one matches that description too. The one before it showed it really clearly. Uh, you know, with the, the roach coming down from the shoulders, moving to the left and then coming back up and uh, the rounded loin and, uh, you know, this dog matches that, that wording exactly. And uh, again, matching the art, there are straight back dogs in the art too, but, uh, you know, my dogs are half English Bulldog, and this is an English Bulldog back, although not as extreme. Yes, you say hind legs are well muscled and slightly longer than the forelegs. Angulation is moderate. And I think that's true with the classic type, you know, moderate angulation. I think a lot of people think AKC show ring, uh, crazy. I think a lot of that is over angulated for a Bulldog. Um, also, you, you know, talk I, about dog. I don't want to, Go ahead. I, I like a. I like a. I, I don't want a straight front leg. You know, I want to. Um, I want the front leg to be shock absorbing. Uh, this one could be a little bit straighter, but not too bad. Uh, a little bit down in the in the uh, in the front. But, uh, you know, I do want some angle there for, for shock absorbing. And again, really nice, Miranda, nice stifles on this dog. Right, yeah, the front end is nice. It's not too steep where it causes the dog to ad uh, adopt a very upright set. You got that 20 degree probably angulation in the pastern there. Uh, nice turn to the stifle. You see the shelf, the toes of the, uh, you know, line up the shelf of the buttock here. And just a very nice, well put together dog. Um, another part of the standard you talked about, or in the standard, was dogs having 42 teeth. And you say that uh, some teeth may be missing in the premolar. How many teeth are acceptable for missing? God, I forget. I, th I, think, I think it's two. Okay, two. Okay. And I was just uh, uh, looking here. You know, Do you Doberman's. Dobermans allow four premolars to be missing, AKC Dobermans. And, uh, you know, usually missing teeth are in the premolars. And, uh, you know, th these are unerupted. They're not, not knocked out teeth, they're, which can't be helped, but they're unerupted. And that can be a problem because uh, they can get infected and need surgery at that point. We've never had one get infected. Um, but you know, it's a it's good reason not to have uninterrupted teeth. I, I I saw a dog. I didn't count them all, but it was missing 18 teeth in Europe. I mean, it's, wow. Uh, and it's funny in American bulldogs, people don't really check the teeth uh, at shows I've been at. And I remember in Canada, the last show I was at, I was the only one checking teeth and. I, I never, I don't think I've ever seen a standard missing a tooth unerupted, but, um, but bully dogs, it's not real uncommon to be missing some premolars. Right. Yeah, I think uh, now um, it has become a bigger topic of discussion and people are looking at it more within the breed. I noticed that most bully dogs are probably missing around that two to four premolars as well. And I do start to see the standard dogs also missing premolars at this stage. You, it's As we go through this, what I found uh, interesting with the standard was that you were dealing with a lot of the same faults that us as classic and uh, standard and just American Bulldog breeders are as well. Um, you know, another serious fault was, uh, was interesting. Serious faults were a single dewlap slit nostrils, loose shoulders, upright shoulders, loose elbows, weak pasterns, and just being too vertical or too horizontal. Um, you know, I think that uh, one of the major things is stenotic nares that we're seeing. So yeah, the slit nostrils, 
You talk about uh, wall eyes or crossed eyes, entropian, ectropian, cherry eye. Um, the nose, any color nose other than black um, is a fault. Um, you know, rye bite, overbite, kink tail, dog tail, bobbed or screw tail. Um, I noticed on the um, leather bulldogs, you have a nice big thick tail. Is that from the Mastiff? Yeah, we never use Mastiff and I, I can't, it's hard to find a healthy Mastiff for me. Uh, we use Bull Mastiff and- That's uh, a, I'm sorry, uh, I, I said- Two of I the said, things, that's okay. Two, yeah. two of the things we have to watch for, you know, you can't, you can hardly have the nostril too open. You know, slit nostrils are a real problem in bulldogs and have to, we have to constantly watch that. And tails, if the tail is up and curled too much, all you see is the tail. So that's another thing. And uh, I like a terrier tail. It, it, it's, it's important that the tail taper and that's something we have to work on. Um, otherwise it gets club-like and, uh, so, you know, those are things we're looking at now right. to, to refine. Now, the color blue gray, um, again, not acceptable. Males lacking two fully undecepted uh, uh, normal testicles, and you said rear dew claws. Um, what were some of the problems? Like, here, we'll look at these pictures here first. But so, again, nice, well angulated dog here. Um, nice Levitt Bulldog. And then I'll let you describe these uh, photos as we go through here. So this is Canacross with uh, J Jan Pettit. Uh, this is competition and the dog helps pull you and you run for those who haven't seen it. That this dog is, is moving. As you can tell, that rope is taut and it's, uh, it's moving. There are not a lot of bulldogs doing this. My wife is in a lot better shape than me. So this looks like me when we go on hikes. I take our big standard mail and <laughs> hang on to the leash and just let them pull me so I can keep up. And uh... so this is Mario DeFosses in Canada. Uh, he's an ammo specialist. And this is his dog, Cannonball. It was the first bulldog to go through Canadian military service dog certification. And uh, it's a wonderful dog and did a lot of good therapy work with the dog. And uh, Mario's a great guy. And, uh... yeah, and this is his, his female that uh, he did search and rescue with. Uh, you know, he, I, I mentored him and he said, you know, one of my what should I do with the dogs? And I said, work them. And he went and did it, you know, great guy and, uh, and did it. And it was, it was wonderful for the dogs and also very good for him. You know, he was, he was a veteran and, uh, you know, saw a lot of action in Afghanistan. Great guy. The type of owner we all look for. Yeah. Few and far between this dog. Dog actually has legs. You can't see there, but uh, this is Isabel's dog, and you know, nice jump. This looks like probably Beast of the East, or maybe a Canadian show. I'm not sure. We got Keith O'Sullivan here. Yeah, and, uh, yeah it's Kenny and his dog for uh, hardest hitting. Nice. And I remember you going back and talking about Brian yeah. Miller. I've seen Brian Miller's dogs. In fact, there was a couple pulling at uh, um, UK or UPF Nationals last week. And I've also seen, uh, I think it was Ray Barrera um, try and catch one in Tennessee and, and uh, definitely ended up on his butt and uh, big old bully male that uh, was doing that. We have uh, some weight pull here. And then I wanted to throw these in earlier, and this goes to your kennel setup that you had. And we discussed it last year about you being basically an engineer, an architect, and building solar uh, efficiency places. Tell us about this kennel setup. 
So this is a 10 run kennel. And for those of you who ever do a, a kennel, there's some details I wanna show you here. Um, I have a step down into the kennel. So if you look above the gates, you, you'd hit your forehead if you didn't have that rise up like that. Um, here, conti continue on Troy, I'll show some. There's a crock there uh, coming up, cement crock coming up from the ground that's set right on a septic tank. So uh, I sh oh, that that's a hot walker I built and I, I had wood chips down for surface once I was finished. And um, you know, you can, I had a speed control over on the kennel that I could get the dogs on it and then uh, warm them up with walking and then trot them, run them, and then uh, cool them down on it. And then the next day I could reverse it and do the other direction so they didn't become one-sided. Uh, if I had it to do again, it's better to buy a, one that's already manufactured for horses. Uh, I had motorcycles and my fabricator built that with me and it was, it was, uh, it was a lot of trouble to do. Uh, it looks like you could fit four yeah, dogs on there, is that correct? Yeah, four, four dogs. Okay, so here's details I want to show you. Uh, when you, first of all, you need more slope than concrete guys are used to, so you don't get urine puddling. So I think we were at, at one inch per foot. So there's a lot of slope here. And then at the end, I have a polymer cast gutter. Uh, it's a manufactured piece which has slope built into it. And then I have a step up to the sidewalk and you want that step. So when you wash down, the manure doesn't end up on the sidewalk and you have to wash the sidewalk every day. Uh, so that's one of the details. There's a, there's a curb between each run so that uh, you don't wash manure from one end to the other. And also that it lifts the fence up so that the foot of the fence doesn't, uh, doesn't rust and rot off so quickly. And the same at the dog house. It's a step up so you can wash down and not be washing mess into the house. Uh, I free fed the dogs, which isn't, isn't a good thing to do, but you know, I didn't know at the time and that's the way I did it. And then I've got an enclosure with water bowls and heat elements from horse waterers. So in winter time, the water didn't freeze. Each of those has a thermostat and a heat element and one heat element covers two runs. Uh, the dog houses, there's like a little attic above each house. And in the middle, there's a, uh, a fan set up with a thermostat so that in the heat of summer that it would ventilate through. I mean, it's nice if the dogs don't need it and maybe mine didn't need it, but I wanted it and I, I ventilated it in the heat of summer. Uh, the dog houses had a divider down the middle so that I didn't have to have dog doors. So uh, they stepped into the first chamber and then the second chamber had a small door. It was insulated with two inch urethane uh, covered with galvanized so that the, the dogs would keep that back channel chamber warm. Uh, old, old design I picked up in an old dog kennel book. And then I've got shade fabric up above that I'd take off in the winter time in the summer, I put the shade fabric up. So ladies and gentlemen, if you wanna know how to build a kennel, that's how it's done. I mean, very well thought out. And that's through a process of somebody who's cleaned out kennels a lot, who's perfected it. And uh, so thank you for sharing that with us because there's so many techniques and so many uh, uh, ways in making things smoother, easier, more efficient, save you time, and also to keep things clean. Um, going back just slightly, Problems you encountered, we went through the standard. So was there just any major problems you encountered through your first uh, or your early productions with the Levitt Bulldogs? Uh, I had a hip dysplasia with a, a puppy with a, an American hero. The dog was, had a uniform on the Marine base. It just killed me that, that his dog went lame. And, uh, you know, that affected me a lot. And... Uh, I had one dog that had epilepsy and I dropped that line. You know, with what we know now about being polygenetic, probably the others in that litter were fine, but in an abundance of caution, I dropped the whole line. Uh, occasional dog ripped its knees. Um, 
had a dog that was entropian, you know, with the bigger problems, entropian is a real problem, but not nothing like a lame dog. Uh, so those were, those were things I faced. I had an American bulldog that had prolapse of the vagina and luckily that didn't take surgery and that just pushed it back in and it stayed in. And uh, so all of this, just like with building your kennel, there's reasons for everything. And just like there's reason for the rules that you develop with the Levitt Bulldog Association. And this is why I wanted to earlier show everybody about your website, the Levitt Bulldog Association. They have breeding rules and standards, which I think every registry should have. And a couple, just to read down through here real quickly, females must be minimum of 24 months before breeding, males 18 months. Uh, they have to be approved for breeding by the Levitt Bulldog Association. Females cannot be bred on two consecutive heats, so no back-to-back -back litters. Breeding is prohibited between brother and sister, father and daughter, and son and mother, so no inbreeding. And um, dogs with mild hip dysplasia can only be bred to dogs that, hips, that have hips with a grade of fair or better. So nothing below mild. So you got uh, fair and then below that mild. So nothing below mild. And then it talks about dogs with mild uh, elbow dysplasia can only be bred with dogs that have an elbow grade of normal. And then, of course, the degenerative myelopathy carriers can only be bred to clear dogs. Um, so, Troy, Troy, let me say a couple of things about this. Uh, I would like to be stricter. And the truth of the, uh, the matter is that, that we had to settle on that. I would like to say no breeding of mild dysplasia, but even after 50 years of work, um, we get the occasional mild and uh, we don't want to lose the rest of the genetic material by being too strict on that. You know, I, I was more strict. Um, so for, for hips and elbows, that's, that's we, we started out stricter and, and we loosened that up a little bit. Uh, let's see, what were the other ones? Uh, um, you talked about hips and elbows. My, myelopathy. Correct. You know, we we really. I thought I had taken that off. We we don't uh, genetic test for that anymore because unless you have a diagnosed case, you don't have to to test for for DM. Uh, we had one that was not diagnosed that that had similar symptoms, but it, it, we it, it must have been a mistake. And the French bulldogs in England went through this that they they had twelve of them. They thought they had DM and all of them turned out to not have it. And the only way to diagnose it is with a, an autopsy and testing the spinal cord. And most people, when they lose their dog, don't want to go through that and, and cut them up. So, uh, you know, we, we don't really, we don't test for DM. We haven't had a, a, a diagnosed DM case. So, you know, we, we jumped on that too quick and backed off. Uh, exactly. So. Here we go through the testing uh, for the breeding stock. And, you know, you have hips, elbow, spine. Interesting. You have a tooth chart and all this is recorded on this website. You can go through and look at all the stud dogs. You can look at the dogs being bred and see their tooth chart even and what dogs are missing. Uh, genetic testing. Confirmation and movement. You, you know, require photos and videos to assess confirmation and movement. Five photos of the dog showing all four sides in one of the face. Uh, a video of the dog trotting, and there's a process of applying for actual breeding approval. Um, we talked about the different levels of registration um, before, these LBA papers, approved for breeding, transitional papers, provisional papers, outcross papers, non-breeding papers. Anything you'd like to say about that? You know, looking at this, creating a line is a real hard process. And the best way to be successful is to have a lot of dogs. And it's, it's really hard for, for, for most, uh, most operations to do it. The Continental Bulldog had eight unrelated lines and, uh, and still there's some genetic problems came out. Uh, you know, 
it's a very hard thing to do. And we've been very lucky that, that, that we haven't had uh, the huge genetic problems come out. And, uh, you know, you can see it in your breed that there've been some things that come out and it's really a lot of, a matter of luck. And there's only so much you can do to keep the dogs healthy. And, you know, you, you just have to deal with what happens and do your best with it. Um, we set this up the best we could. Uh, again, I would really like to have more lines involved and, uh, you know, it, it, it's hard and it's hard to have good breeders. That's, that's the main thing. And, uh, it's, no, a, it's I, a hard process. You know, I, I had a famous dog man, Tom Stodshow of the Animal Research Foundation. And, uh, we were talking about it and he had a, a clockwise breeding program with one stud in the middle and all the females around. It was really pretty closely bred. And he was a, uh, he brought in Australian cattle dogs and, you know, he was a working dog guy from Texas. Uh, and he said, yeah, with the cows, when we have a problem, we can eat the problem. And, and I said to him, yeah, we, we have a problem. It's just the opposite. You know, the problem eats us. And it's a shame Tom Stodshill died delivering a dog. Uh, the family didn't want him to go. He was taking a dog to the airport, flash flood happened and he and the dog were drowned. So, you know, wonderful old dog man and neat guy. Now the results from all these uh, um, plans that were implemented through the Levitt Bulldog Association, your breathing has gotten better. C-sections aren't necessary, uh, typically unless an emergency. Um, AIs due to ineptness or lack of drive or nat and natural ties are uh, a possibility. Lifespan over 11 years. And of course, the breeding stock is uh, tested. And you know, one thing that I like to read was that one of your quotes was, I am now achieving my goal of producing a bulldog with the health and temperament to be able to serve people instead of forcing people to serve him. And I find that so true and uh, something that we see today. So many dogs, you're maybe walking them in the morning or walking them at night or very limited ability to walk because of uh, joint problems and, and issues. And uh maybe severe allergies, but so many dogs with medical problems that, you know, should have been sorted better and it's led us to serve them instead of them being serving us. Um, as I was going through here, I was just going down through on your site here, some famous Levitt bulldogs and these dogs look like bulldogs and, uh, you know, there's obviously always a hot topic in, in regards to uh, American Bulldogs, and it's about what crosses were in there, what crosses were not in there, why some dogs look like a St. Bernard, why some dogs, you know, look like this or that. But one thing about these Levitt Bulldogs is they look like Bulldogs. And I think that goes back to the beginning that the only breeds of dogs used went back to the old Bulldog lines. Anything to uh, say about that, Dave? A lot of dogs, and you know, my my biggest regret in dogs are ones that that I regret I didn't do more for them. Uh, you know, I did the best I could, but you know, that's what my regrets are. And a, a lot of these kennel dogs, you know, it's it's too bad they all can't be in the house. And when I had a kennel full. Uh, each day I take one out and train it and uh, it's really not enough and uh, the dogs need to be worked more they need more attention and they need to do more uh, and for for care you know I, I had two whelping boxes in the barn and they were insulated and had radiant panels in the top and I had a bed built into the side with portholes so that I could set the clock for uh, wake me up once an hour and I could just roll over and look through the porthole and see if the dog needed help. But, uh, you know, it's a lot of great dogs and, you know, uh, 
uh, really now we know better how to handle them and how to take care of them. And, you know, I regret I didn't do more. No, I think that I was going to say, I think you were ahead of your time because I don't know that you saw people doing that at that time, but you still don't see a lot of people breeding dogs who um, pay that much attention, who care that much. And so it speaks volumes about who you were as a person, who you were as a dog breeder and just as a breed enthusiast and advocate. Um, Trans last week we didn't weren't able to really get into it but it was just about the American Bulldog the American Pit Bulldog and here we have a picture of Lady Grace and it was a uh, from the Carl's book uh, the world of fighting dogs and it says a fine American Bulldog but when and how did you learn about the American Pit Bulldog or uh, American Bulldog how did you come how did you learn about them must have been the Animal Research Foundation first. Uh, I, I'm, that's, I, I, got, I was a member and got their newsletter and uh, John D was a, a member and I probably saw him there first. And it was a different MKC with a different owner and John D was with them too at that time. And again, they were originally called American Pit Bulldog and, you know, it was a it's a really good change to change it to American Bulldog. Um, did you seek out John D. Johnson? Uh, I was kind of going back through um, an interview with David Jackson, and it just said that you had done the Bull Mastiff, uh, Pit Bull, EB crosses, and you didn't necessarily get what you were looking for. So you kind of went to his uh, yard to uh, look at dogs. Is, it, is that your recollection of things? You know, I wanted more genetic diversity, and uh, and I went down and you know if, if if the American pit bulldog was was exactly what I wanted in breeding true to form, I wouldn't have done my I would have just bought dogs and been fine. But uh, you know, I wanted to tweak what was happening there, and and there was a good bit of variation. And you know, you've got some of my pictures of the early dogs, and you'll see. Uh, this is, you know, she's fat here. This was a very nice dog, uh, Lady Grace. You know, she's probably just had puppies there and uh, she was in condition. She, she looked much better than that. And, and I bred her with jigs. That was my first breeding with the American Bulldog. Okay. Did, yeah. um... And out of that... So JD, uh, I think JD, uh, John D. Johnson got a female from that breeding uh, named Gail. Uh, he named that after, is that your wife's name, Gail? Yes. And he said he named it after your uh, wife. And uh, she ended up being like 125 pounds. And he bred her to Incredible Hulk, uh, which uh, uh, created the Incredible Mean Machine line. And... Uh, I think you said that you had kept a female out of this, but you dropped that line because of the prolapse. You know, I, I couldn't find the record, but there was a reason that I didn't use it. I did have one of his dogs that, that had prolapse, and I think it was this one. Right. Now, did you, um, obviously you were interested in the American Bulldogs at the time, but did you, envision them merely as a piece in the bigger plan? Um, and in retrospect, do you think that um, they were a good introduction to your oldie line or could you have done it without them? That's a good question. And, you know, if, if I had it to do it again, it could have been done much simpler. When I went through all my old pedigrees and, uh, recently, Boy, I had a lot of lines that were dead ends and that I didn't use. And um, I had I had breedings with Bull Mastiff and with Pitbull that that you didn't see the bulldog in them, and it took a couple of generations. If I had it to do over again and the size dogs I want, I think I would do it with uh, with an, uh, with English Bulldog and uh, American Pitbull Terrier, and. Uh, you know, I would try try and find a, a line of terrier that wasn't animal aggressive, 
and uh, there are some uh, with, with social temperaments and that it would be easier to get a dog that looks the way I want that way uh, you know than, than all the breeds I used. Uh, there was there was one guy before me who bred the Regency Bulldog in England and he used Bull Terrier which already had the weird head and Bulldog and he got some very nice looking dogs you know, it's too bad they had extreme animal aggression and he had to stop because of that. Uh, Clifford Derwent, he was a, uh, a real character and a great guy. And, uh, you know, it's too bad he came before me. And all through the South, there probably been crossbred dogs for, for 100 years or 200 years. Um, so right. that's my answer. No, I, I, I like it. And I, I like that input to hear um, if you regretted using the AB or in retrospect, how would you do it today? So it's very enlightening to hear about the English Bulldog and the uh, Pit Bull. And uh, when I, there was a question here, I was kind of going down through here and I was getting a little bit out of order and I wanted to... Uh, Um, ask you here. Oh, was the term utility dog an accurate representation at the time when you saw the American Bulldogs, when you went to John D. Johnson's yard? Were they a utility dog? You know, there were a lot of dogs in that yard and he still, you know, when I went down, he had, I don't know how many, he had one cow at least. And the story was that, you know, the wild dogs would come in and, and try and kill the, tr kill the cow. And, uh, and one of his dogs would take on a whole pack of wild dogs. And, uh, you know, it, it's hard to say what, what really happened. Uh, you know, he, he later, I, I sent a friend down who was an excellent trainer, both he and his brother, the, the Cupper brothers. And uh, he had the first trained pit bull that I ever saw. And it was, it was a perfect dog and excellent at protection under complete control and not dog aggressive. And uh, they went down on, on my say so. And uh, John D had a pen with his protection dog in it. And he went in the house for something and came out. And, and one of the brothers was in the pen with the dog. And, uh, you know, again, John D wasn't a protection trainer. And, that dog, I'm sure, could have been trained to have not let somebody in the pen like that, but uh, they didn't come back with a dog. So, yeah, I mean, unless unless you you know the dog did what was said, uh, it's it's a story, and uh, I don't know I don't know if a pack of wild dogs would be timid like coyotes. You know, I don't know if. They would come in and, a, and fight a dog. They might, you know, if they were hungry enough. I Probably somebody who knows feral dogs would be able to say if, if that happens. Uh, you know, I don't think it would happen with coyotes. They seem to be smarter and uh, they, would, they would definitely take on a dog and maybe, maybe a pack of wild dogs would. And... Uh, you know, the, with, a, with a yard full of dogs, they're definitely going to bark when somebody comes, and that's that's the main thing. Uh, so, you know, again, I, I know what what I saw in Georgia, and I saw a yard of dogs, and uh, I'm sure how would you, they protected how would you the have yard. Of dogs. How would you have described the bulldogs at that time? Um, color were they mostly white, pied? Yes. Mm -hmm. How about size? How would you describe them size-wise? Was there a wide variance? There was a good bit. The, the females varied more than the males and they were already getting up in size when I was there. Uh, you know, I don't know if you have my pictures of the ABs, uh, but we could go through them and you could see the range. Uh, yeah, you've got those pictures. I and, do. You know, let's got let's some go ahead and look through them right now. Um, so this dog, 
is King Kong. Mm -hmm. So that, that may have been the first big one. And uh, I think John D. Johnson said again, this he was the first double champion. So I imagine it was NKC and ARF at the time. But this dog, King Kong, was supposedly the first double champion. Probably NKC. Okay. So that's Dick the Bruiser. And the, the story I had is he came off a porch that John D. bought him from somebody up in the hills and wanted some new blood. And that th this was a dog up there unrelated to his. And uh, you know, he, he, had, he was a nice dog. He was kind of regal and nice temperament. Yes, this is an you know, interesting, I, interesting dog, a beautiful dog, one of the earlier uh, pictures I've seen of the breed and supposedly he was bought in 1956 or 57 by a guy San uh let's see here I had uh, wrote down a few things here from Big Sam Mountain in Alabama from Harold Lassiter and when he had bought him he was supposedly a proven catch dog already um but he said he died at nine and a half years old of a heart attack um but it's interesting because he says this was the first registered American Bulldog study had. Um, but, and he bought him in 56 and 57, just some things that didn't add up. Regardless, this is Dick the Bruiser. And um, were you able to see Dick the Bruiser in the flesh? Yeah, that was my picture and that was 1977. Okay, so this is 1977. So by accounts in the breed, he would have been like 20, 21 years old or more at this stage. And uh, so, but just a kind of an interesting factor, just some information uh, about Dick the Bruiser. Um, we go on here to see Dick the Bruiser again, but an absolute beautiful female here. I loved her. Hold on just a second, Dave. I got a puppy and I'm going to put her out because I think she might be messing up the broadcast here. Bob, be right back. Sorry again for that. And uh, I got a four month old puppy and she is ready to be walked. And uh, so we'll get her out here in a bit. Um, so Golden Lady, I would own this dog today. This is just a beautiful, beautiful Me specimen. Too. I could see the withers here. I could see kind of the uh, spinal column. Dogs like this, it seems to be are mainly genetic. And being on John D's yard, I would say like here, you can even see obliques on her a little bit. This is genetically what this dog was because I've seen a lot of Johnson dogs and they weren't built like this. And she was a smaller dog too. Yeah, I love the type. And so with Golden Lady, um, was this type present prior to the English Bulldog being added? Oh yeah. Yeah, and uh, because I know that uh, he went back and he talked about that um, the machine line uh, represented the Bulldogs of his youth, Elrod as well, and Bo Donald, but these dogs existed pre-West uh, Champs High Hopes Infusion. Yes. All right, and uh, so... Um, you know, going back and learning a little more, is there any stories or anything that you fond memories you have of visiting with Johnson or talking with them? He and Mildred were very kind to me. And one time my wife and I stayed with him for a night. Uh, the motel in town was a mess and uh, they were very kind. And 
you know, live for their dogs and Northwest Georgia was a, a different place for me and uh, uh, they were very welcoming and, you know, getting ready for this, I was going through my files and I, I, I have seven letters from him and, uh, you know, very nice guy and a, a good friend to me. It's funny you mentioned that about Georgia being a little different place. I, in uh, high school, moved from, uh, I grew up in Maine and New Brunswick, Canada, but I actually moved in high school from New Brunswick, Canada to Charleston, South Carolina. And like you said, it was a bit of a, it was a bit of a culture shock. It's definitely a different place. And, uh, but definitely enjoyed my time while being there. Um, you know, John D talked about breeding dogs um, and extensively after World War II, after returning from World War II, he had recovered some dogs from his family and um, continued to breed them. Uh, were you able to see any pictures of those early dogs? I don't think I did, no. No, I was just, uh, I was just I curious about that. Them. You know, I've seen, since then, I've seen one picture of him as a, as a child with a bulldog. And, okay. And uh, it wasn't an, wasn't an English bulldog, but that's it. No, I didn't at the time. Now, you were familiar with a lot of dogs. You were well-rounded. Uh, what would you have described the temperament of the uh, American bulldog at that time? They were all friendly, good temperament for me. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I, the ones that I had were, were not especially dog aggressive, but, you know, Dick the Bruiser looked like he would have grabbed a dog. You know, it's hard to say. A lot of those big dogs uh, might have had same sex aggression, but, you know, they weren't out of control like some. Uh, pit bull yards that I had been to. Now for the ones who maybe, you know, with your history now of dog training and stuff, were there some aloof ones? Were there some that seemed to have a little bit of a weaker temperament? Or what would you have attributed to dogs like that rebel rouser where your buddies went down, he was supposedly nobody could get in the kennel with him or even handle him and they ended up getting in the kennel with him? Again, you know, it, it's hard if you don't have a dog trained. I've seen some some very tough dogs that uh, haven't been desensitized to to distraction and uh, and are tested and fail. And it's really not fair to the dog. So you know that that's my feeling that unless you have to test them and and see. And I didn't test any of them. And um, I don't know if I patted Dick the Bruiser, but I, I think I patted all the rest of them. Some of them were, you know, excitable and would jump on you, but not an aggression. Now, we, we briefly talked about King Lady Grace, and um, now you ended up with two females, or that, you know, we are aware of anyway, one being King Lady Grace, um, and also uh, Georgia Girl, or the original Sugar Doll. Um, how did you come across, did you pick up King Lady Grace when you went to visit Johnson? And Yes. Yes. And then with Sugar Doll, how did you get her, a Georgia girl? I leased Lady Grace and Sugar Doll. I must have bought, I don't know if I, in the beginning I bought her or, or I leased her and then he decided I should keep her and uh, I sold her on to somebody I knew. Uh, okay. After I used her for breeding at the time, I wanted to get to the ge next generation as fast as possible, which is a problem for breeding because you can pick out a puppy that's good at two months old and at two years old, it may not be the best one. But, uh, you know, Georgia again had a, a good, friendly temperament. Absolutely. I had heard a story out there about Georgia girl, and I think it was maybe Georgia girl. And I think someone had said maybe her original owner or uh, the guy's wife was allergic to her color or something. I found that uh, pretty funny. And uh, might have been to her coat, not her color. Yeah, yeah. That's that's what I would have would have thought for sure. And um, so, 
Actually, um, actually, this dog went went to my partner's mistress. I I, I can't really say anything about that, other than I probably get in trouble. No, I'm just kidding. And uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, as we go down through here, and like I said, we're kind of uh, moving around on these uh, Johnson questions I had here. We kind of went down through their looks and stuff, but. King Lady Grace, um, you bred her and you bred Georgia Girl. What happened with the pups out of those breedings? Lady Grace's puppies, I didn't use. Um, Georgia Girl, um, I did use them on my second line. And uh, actually, four females from that litter went to John D in 1979. And uh, I understood he sold them. Right. And do you know of what dogs, I mean, he took, uh, you had Sugar Doll, then he got back, what was it? Sugar Doll 3 off of her, I want to say. He got Bull Meads Queen and Sugar Doll 3. You said he had got multiple pups uh, from those, from some of those breedings. And um, you said, were those the only dogs he got from you or were there other dogs along the way from your other breedings that he uh, got dogs from you? No, he got, got one that was uh, one generation down from his cross, um, dog I called Diamond Head, and that was in 78. And I understood he sold that one. That was a really nice puppy, Mark Nice and good body and uh, Another one of those went to Grady Burrell, who was also in Somerville, Georgia. And then uh, let's see, the other breeding I did, he didn't, didn't get a puppy from. That was Jigs and Pepper Pot, uh, Pepper Pot of Alan Scott, Scott. And Dick the Bruiser was the sire of Pepper Pot. And, uh, he did not get one of those puppies. I would have loved to have seen those puppies off of Jigs and Pepper Pot just to see what they look like. I bet they were uh, pretty cool looking dogs. So the other dog that he got from you, you said the mother was Happy B, a quarter uh, pit bull and a half uh, bull mastiff. Um, went to JDG, uh, to Johnson and he sold, supposedly sold the pup, um, never used it, but it was a very nice uh, pup. And the father uh, right. was an AB from that. And uh, so, um, now, West Champs High Hopes, did you, um, you used him, another person owned him, of course, you're developing these uh, dogs, and uh, it's better not to own everything, it's better when you're able to use it, and then keep space for the dogs that you choose to move forward with, um, but just tell us about West Champs High Hopes real briefly, you did this last week, but just run down through it for us. He was bought to be a champion, kept growing, and um, my friend put him with a at a, a home for a Catholic home for delinquent boys, and my friend was the headmaster, and, and uh, the dog ran with the track team, and had a great temperament and a lot of energy. And nice dog. And size wise, just tell us about his size. Eighty pounds. You know, he was twenty five percent bigger than a bulldog should have been. Now, West Champs, he, is he unfairly criticized and blamed for AB health issues? A lot of people are like, oh, it was English Bulldog that was added and this, but it sounds like he was an English Bulldog, but he was pretty functional. He had good size. I could see traits that he added for bone, for type, and helping to set type. And that's how come before I wanted to ask you about, was this type uh, available pre-West Champs infusion? Uh or did the dogs look more like Sandman the Great um, and, you know, Dick the Bruiser? Does he get an unfair well, rap? I was, I was worried that the dogs were inbred when I went down there. Um, that there hadn't, there was Alan Scott and John D. I mean, other than getting a dog off the porch, where was he getting new blood? So I right. was worried about that. And, uh, you know, the, the dogs that I got out of Jigs, uh, I had I had one that, that got epilepsy. And okay. uh, 
other than that, I, I didn't have any other problems. So Jiggs was a, was a good addition for my dogs. And uh, I had them in both sides of my two lines. And I don't, I don't think physical problems came from him. What were these F1s like off West Champs High Hopes? How would you describe them? And let's just go with temperament, type, like everything. What, what did you see from West Champs Productions? They weren't dog aggressive. They weren't people aggressive. Um, you know, they were good natured, you know, had a, had a, a friendly temperament. Uh, you know, that says a lot. You know, several people I've talked to that uh, breed, uh, have multiple breeds, whether it's oldies, uh, you know, standards, classics, they talk about how when outcrossing to like a, uh, another breed or outcrossing to an English bulldog, that some of the F1s are even bigger than, they're kind of surprised at the size that you can get from these F1s, thinking you would shrink a dog down by breeding to an English bulldog. What would you see size-wise from these F1s? I never saw anything like the size you're talking about for Gale. You know, 120 pounds, you know, that, that was the, the ones that the males I kept were, were probably 80 pounds. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, what was the rest of that question? Yeah, I was just asking about the F1s, like what you saw, like size-wise, and you were kind of describing it. So um, you weren't seeing necessarily monsters, because you started with King Lady Grace, who's a 120-pound dog. Would you say that's true? She's 120 pounds? No, not even no. close. Okay. Not even okay. close. Not, okay. not way. <laughs> <laughs> And it does. Uh, so I was just curious about these F1s. If, if you noticed, did they uh, have more bone? Did they have more type? How would you have described the departure from the American Bulldog? You know, they came out pretty, some generations, uh, one side is prepotent with those. They were pretty much in the middle between the two. Now, uh, going back through some of these pictures, because I want to get through uh, the rest of these pictures that are your pictures. Um, I'm not too familiar with these pictures here. Do you? No, those are John D. Dogs. Okay, just, just for context and, and what the breed was. Um, yeah, so this was a male on top and below is a, a female and she had kind of a crooked tail. A um, little bit of skin problem around the eyes, but it was I really liked this dog, and he had a brush fire uh, after this, and the dog supposedly was trying to bite the flames, and she got burned, and uh, she survived. But I I sort of felt horrible that I hadn't hadn't tried to get her more and take her with me because she, she was bullier than most of his females, and again you see she's got kind of these big feet. Uh, not something I wanted, but uh, she was a nice dog. Yeah, nice dog and a cool story for sure. Here we have King Kong and we have Sandman the Great down here. Anything you'd like to yeah. tell me about these dogs? Yeah, he was a nice dog. Again, you know, big bulldog temperaments. Uh, they were not Malinois. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Now, Sandman the Great, this is kind of what I envision, like the old Southern Bulldog, Plantation Dog, um, Whiting English Bulldog. I kind of associate maybe this look with uh, more of a original Bulldog uh, type. But um, was he, did he stick out like a sore thumb in the yard or was there other dogs that looked like him? You know, you can see... Uh, he was uh, he was not as as extreme as uh, King Kong, and I thought he was exceptionally good. You know, nice confirmation. I, I thought he was a class act there. Now it looks like we still got King Kong here at an older uh, age, and then it looks like Dick the Bruiser down here at an older age as well. And this is a. 
This is that female up above. She was a nice dog. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. This was, a, uh, I think, uh, more pictures that we had uh, previously talked about. And then I couldn't tell at first because of the darkness of the individual in the pictures and stuff like that. But I saw this skinny leg up here and a tall gentleman. And uh, you told me, who is this? This is Alan Scott. Those were Polaroids he sent me. And uh, he was very kind. I, I came across one of his letters, too. And uh, we were both young men then. And he had some nice dogs. You know, I really, really liked the dog that upper left hand corner one and uh, and down the lower right hand corner that was a nice male i think it was dixie man yeah beautiful beautiful dog and now that you mention it, it looks like it's the same dog facial marking wise these two um you had to be pretty committed at that time and be into dogs we're talking about handwriting letters and then sending them in the mail at that time how long were was it taking for correspondence to occur i mean Imagine that you don't have a template set that everybody who uh, contacts you, you kind of get send them a general response at first to find out information about them. Um, you guys had to handwrite these out. There was no template. This was pretty hardcore stuff. You had to be uh, quite an addict to probably uh, correspond in that day. I, I'll tell you, I had a friend who was interested in, uh, in those white English bulldogs in Florida. And uh, you had to drive in and you had to be brought by somebody who knew the people. You didn't go knock on a door there that, you know, the, the, the ancestors were bootleggers and, you know, the, the current people were probably making, cooking meth. And, uh, you know, you couldn't just walk up on a porch. You had to be brought there. So it was, it was even worse. <laughs> and then I, I finally, after all the effort got up there, the dogs really didn't look very good at all. <laughs> and, you know, they were not fireball hog hunters and, you know, uh, he didn't want anything to do with them. Uh, this is Grady Burrell. He had American pit bulldogs at the time. He was in Somerville, Georgia, and he got a dog for me. I think that dog on the bottom left is uh, Alan Scott and an Alan Scott dog. Okay, that does that does look like uh, Alan probably there. And uh, some more Grady Burrell here, I think in this pit in this picture here, are these dogs, these other dogs his as well? Yeah, I think again, the one in the lower left, I think is Alan Scott, but the others are Grady. Okay. more of his okay this dog up here in the top right hand corner looks like a classic johnson type dog yeah that's where the dogs came from now here's a different yard yes that's painter exactly so with the painter uh dogs Obviously, more color than the other photos we've seen at this time, um, probably just because of their genetic makeup and the uh, uh, different ways that they were created. That's safe to say. And here in this top right corner, I love this picture. I don't even know if I've seen this picture before. And uh, tell us who that is. I think that's the painter dog too. Yeah, I think that's Sergeant Rock up there. Very, very uh, cool to see the picture and to see that dog. And I think going through these pictures on More this next dog. slide here, you kind of had a, you said this dog down here in the uh, bottom right hand corner uh, on the back of the picture, it said like 116th. English Bulldog, Jigs. 116th. Exactly. So you don't, see, when, a, you don't see a lot of Bulldog in that. It's a long right, way no. from that dog. 
No, you don't for sure. And uh, so, um, and just going back through here, uh, we had a couple pictures here. I think this is an F1 here, a King Lady Grace yes. son. And tell us about this dog here. That's you and him in your kennel setup. This is the first kennel. That was, he was a, a great dog, you know, again, uh, not dog aggressive, not people aggressive, uh, nice dog, good companion, a lot of energy, jumper. Here's another one of your oldies. Another beautiful, beautiful dog. Yeah, it's a half jigs. This is off who? That's half Jigs. That's that's half that Bulldog and half American Bulldog. Oh, so is this Jigs Pepper Pot here? Yes, I believe wow. so. Wow, wow, that's very cool. Like I said, going through the presentation, I was wondering like what those offspring would have looked like. So this is English Bulldog to Alan Scott's Pepper Pot. Beautiful, beautiful dog. And then this is one of my favorite yeah, good... oldies of yours. And this was earlier on. And this is a, uh, tell us about this dog. Mox is a first generation and uh, he was crazy for the spring pole. He'd love to bite and his, his kennel gate came open one day and he'd been on the spring pole for an hour. Luckily he survived, it was soaking wet and still on it. And um, he, he got in a fight with his brother before I got him with his owner and, and they were fighting. And it was funny because uh, the cat came around the corner and saw them fighting and jumped right on top of both of them. It was like, fucking cut it, cut it out. Uh, <laughs> But he, he was a great dog and, you know, good friend. Uh, ripped now his with knee Peanut, and came back from about 100 percent. With being an earlier dog, did he carry more bone, more substance than what your today Levitt Bulldogs would have? Would that be an accurate assumption or no? Yes. Yes. Absolutely what are we true. What are we looking at for size on this dog? 80 pounds. 80 pounds, okay. And uh, so, um, and then we go back to Hanson Dan here. But before we get, you said you were gonna take your camera, move around the room a little bit and show us some stuff. Um, I also had a few uh, other questions here. And one was, had you ever heard of the term scuppies? Scuffy? Scuppies, no. one reason why. I had heard through other bulldoggers and they had talked about a smooth coated St. Bernard type uh, bull mastiff EB. There's like a thing that made it up. And uh, it was just a term that was uh, used to describe this type of dog, kind of like a smooth coated St. Bernard type looking dog. And I always hear that with, with John D. Johnson. Some people say, well, do you believe that along with the other lines, like he had Colette, he had um, the mean machine line, which was down from, uh, West Champs High Hopes, do you think that those names of those lines indicated anything else, or do you think it was just for record keeping? It's hard to say, you know, yeah. I, I, I couldn't say. And... Exactly, I, 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 I get that. It was just uh, one of those things that always seems to come up in conversation. And uh, one thing I can say for certain, is that you played a really cool role in the American uh, pit bulldog, American bulldog breed. And Johnny Johnson uh, at that time was an older gentleman at that time. And you were young and in your prime and uh, you still look like you're in your prime today. Um, and, uh, but again, um, there's hardly anybody that can go back and provide the information that you provided us today. Uh, Alan Scott was around back then, um, you, and uh, but very, very few others can bring that knowledge forward. And that's what makes today so special is having someone like you that's not just involved in the American Bulldog breed, the Levitt Bulldog, the Old English Bulldog, 
somebody who's started breeds, who shaped breeds, who bred back, and then somebody who's had influence in the American Bulldog breed that many of the fanciers and enthusiasts such as myself and the Better Bulldog Bureau um, own. And uh, so thank you again for doing this for us. And uh, now for this time, you, you have mentioned a couple other topics and as well as maybe walking around the room, take it away, do what you like. Good, let me do that quick. Uh, sorry to talk so long, but uh, I've got some great breeding resources. And like I said, I'm gonna post links and, and you gotta look. And um, one of the things with one of these, these breeding organizations that came up, uh, the Institute for Canine Biology, very good on breeding. And one thing that was, was groundbreaking for me is I never saw pictures of a day old greyhound puppy. They are up on their feet walking day one. And, uh, you know, the coursing hounds have perfect hips and knees. And uh, this woman, you know, there's definitely a genetic component, but there's a big environmental component. And all puppies are born with perfect hips and knees because there's a big space in between the joints. Right. I mean, I, again, I was shocked when I saw the x-rays of the, of the baby puppies. And this woman has done research on the ideal whelping box uh, floor surface. So, you know, there'll be a link for that and all of you breeding should look and, you know, there's, there's the idea that maybe it should be bowl shaped and keep the puppies in the middle with the bitch around them. But the main thing is that the puppies get traction and that the, every time I see a fat puppy, it bothers me because that may be causing hip dysplasia, having them overweight and, uh, you know, you don't want to starve them, but uh, it's a fine line. And uh, so I'll, I'll put links to those two things. And then there's two wacky things that a lot of people aren't aware of. And uh, one of them is zoo pharmacognosy. Horrible name, but very interesting. And Lar, one of my great breeders, went and took a took a clinic with this woman, and she treats physical and mental problems in dogs and zoo animals with scent. And the cognacy part is that the animal tells which one is the one it needs. And sometimes it just takes a whiff of something, and sometimes she'll put out a bowl and and the animal will lap a whole bunch of it. But when you see the videos of a temperament change after one se session, this is pretty amazing and neat. I'll put a link for that. And the other thing is uh, the longevity research that's being done. And people aren't aware of this. It's been going on for 20 years, pretty much. And uh, they started with yeast which is good for experimental purposes because it has a one week lifespan. So you can do things quick. And this is pretty scary, but yeast has 70% the same genome as humans. You know, some in my family, maybe it's higher. But uh, so uh, they started with this research and they first they sped up aging, like the, the children that age quick uh, they gave the yeast that, they manipulated the genome to have them age quick, and then they did the reverse and they slowed up the aging. And they identified uh, uh, a longevity or a vitality gene. And uh, if genome is a computer, the epigenome is the software. And they've broken this all down. There's 20 years of research at, at you know, the world's best universities now. And uh, they've got, they found that what works on yeast on slowing aging, it worked on worms and then mice and then dogs. And they're doing people research now on slowing aging and, uh, and keeping, keeping cells from deteriorating as quickly. They've got a dog study going with thousands of dogs and uh, you know, they, they, there's supplements now that you could take. And if you're 50 years old or over, it's worth trying because there's no side effects, but I'll put links to that up too and, and very interesting. So, 
So those were the, the wacky things that uh, lifespan by David Sinclair is a book that details the stuff and zoo pharmacognosy is, is really weird and magical, but you know, if it works, that's the important thing. So let me take the camera and uh, I'll walk it around the room and we'll see what you can see. So you, you saw this one. That's my earliest. I'm sorry, I, I can't show you and see it too. So you'll just have to take what you can get. Early bulldog. Those are my first two dogs. My wife made that, she's an artist. So tell us real quick about those two dogs. Is one, uh, was it Polly or Molly or? Yeah, Paul, yeah, Paul is the female. She was my barn guard, and Rowdy was the brother. Those were okay. my first two born. Yeah, let's see. This is a uh, this is crate art, old sport, man against bulldog, bear baiting, political. And they're sorry, hold on. No, this is just fascinating stuff. Most of us have only seen it online or pictures. We don't own it. And uh, so that's really, really cool to see what you've accumulated in your travels abroad. Cigarette cases. Uh, that's uh, Polly's skull. Tell us the story with that real quick. So I would have never had the heart to get it, but she, uh, I think she went off to die in a snowstorm. You know, it was a snowstorm and she came up missing and I was afraid she got taken by dog fighters. And, uh, you know, in the spring, I found the skeleton a couple hundred yards from the barn. And uh, that's how I got the skull. Yeah, that's the Baltan. Now, did you say you saw really, one of those almost like a full-size replica or a full-size piece of that? Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh oh, there... There it is. That's how it the works. The tobacco goes in there. The matches go in the little one. And then the ashes go in the drawer. OK, so this one, the story of this is the guy's Dalmatian got beat up by the neighborhood dogs. So he went to his buddy with the bulldogs, the white bulldogs. And he put black spots on him. And the next day, the dogs came and he let the bulldogs out. That is hilarious. The ultimate revenge right there. So, so this is one of those uh, plaster Paris heads, just, just less than life size. And uh, this dog is like a missing link. It's got a tail. It's a bulldog. That's like the beginning of the end for the bulldog. Right. That white one's probably a Neo. Right. Pitbull. Bulldog with kittens. Interesting, it shows a black and white bulldog with the ducks. This one's yeah, a first screw tail. 
This one up here is the first dog with a screw tail I've seen, Lucy. Okay. That's a lot of people haven't seen that. Uh, this is 1930s, a California painter. Again, a red nose, but the dog's got a nose. Uh, that's First World War propaganda with the Yankee Terrier as the American symbol. Okay. This is a nice dog. And uh, that's the town. Good. Humidor. Oh, I just got this one. This is a uh, inkwell. It's good there. Neat. Very nice. For someone uh. like myself, I've started everywhere I travel looking for bulldog artifacts. And the last, well, not the last one, but one that I really enjoyed is a, is a little piece I got from uh, Russia when I was over there judging a show. And, uh, but to see your collection is mind blowing and the years it took you to, when do you think you started collecting? I mean, obviously we got your first stuffed animal being the Yale Bulldog, but how, how long has this, uh, or when did you start and how long have you been collecting? I started in the seventies as soon as I got into Bulldogs, but, uh, you know, for most of my life, I couldn't afford the, the, the big pieces. And, and, uh, so, you know, it's, and it's, it's gotten more expensive. Oh, here, listen, I'm sorry. I got to move this again. Where do you see this? Uh, getting ready for this. I went through my books and this piece, it killed me. I saw it in England in the eighties and it was $5,000 then, and I couldn't afford it. Uh, but, where do you see this? Nobody's ever seen this. Look at that dog. Wow. So that's uh, 1840 and it's uh, Nettle, the property of the Earl of Cadogan. And uh, that was a big painting too, three feet. So, you know, people say you're breeding boxers. Well, no, that's not a boxer. And, you know, that's what I'd like the dogs to look like. There's no doubt that that is a physical specimen and uh, an athletic specimen, brachiocephalic specimen. You know, one thing that I've enjoyed is seeing in your eyes, you still have a fire and excitement in your eyes in regards to bulldogs. It's not something that's passed. For you, maybe you're not feeding a bulldog right now. Maybe you're not cleaning out kennels, but this has been a lifetime. This has been um, a major part of your life. And even you sharing this with us today, it makes me extremely thankful. And I wanna open this up to you in any way. We're going to post those links on the uh, site here. And I um, would, ask that everybody take the time to look at the stuff that he's been willing to share with us. But maybe on some rainy, boring day when you get down to Florida and you're um, maybe not able to fish or you're not able to do something, maybe we can set up a time and come back and talk about those things. Um, the way you set up things with the Levitt Bulldog Association, it allowed for improvement within a race of bulldog and I feel like in the American bulldog breed that is the only way to move forward and to actually make changes through implementing rules and um, regulations in regards to breeding and testing and uh, you have the results you have the proof and uh, it goes back to your integrity it goes back to you as a breeder who, you know, speaking of that gentleman who ended up having a dog with hip dysplasia, I felt that myself, my good buddy, Mike Bartlett, um, had a couple dogs from me that didn't pass pin hip. And I remember him calling and telling me that. I remember how heart-wrenching it was. And when you feel that, it changes you. And you say, I have to, I was doing all the testing. And 
it still happens. And, you know, um, but it's, you have to feel that and you only know through testing, but you have to feel that in order to want to do better. And you've been through the whole processes of everything involving breeding. And you've came here or come here today to share that with us in a more comprehensive fashion than what we had last week. But again, thank you so much. In parting today, any words of advice for fanciers and enthusiasts, breeders? You know, on the th things you've said, uh, the American Bulldog is, is so different from what I saw in the 70s. And uh, the good American Bulldogs are great dogs, both the bully and the standard. Uh, you know, both of them, uh, I'm sure Alan and John D would love the way the bully dogs are looking now and so powerful and uh, great looking and good temperaments and testable and passing tests. Uh, I remember after a show and going out for dinner with the judges and some of the important breeders and sitting there at the table and me saying to Alan Scott, well, you know, how about x-raying hips? And he bristled and, uh, and you know, the seven eighths rule, I said, well, you know, why not have a, a group of a commission of the important people and then let them decide what comes in, not let everybody put in whatever they want, you know, put in a Malinois and then breed it to look better. I mean, do you really want to do that? And it wasn't well received. And, you know, I understand, you know, it's, it's a reason I only have four breeders in America now. One of the reasons Americans don't want controls and, uh, you know, I came up through the sport horses where you didn't get a brand unless you passed all kinds of tests, including working and, uh, you know, it's just the way it is. And for, for all the people, you know, we're real lucky to share dogs and have a, a creature that idolizes us and, you know, lives in the moment and, and will become what we make them through our training and, and husbandry. And, uh, and the, you know, the bad part is they have a short life and the good part as a breeder is they have a short life and you can, you can make quick advances and, uh, you know, you just have to try it. And the main thing is to do right by the dogs and take the best care of them you can. So thanks a lot. I enjoyed this opportunity and Thanks a lot for, for your interest and keep up the good work. Absolutely. And I and just to expand upon what you said there in a bit, finding like-minded breeders who are doing the same thing, who are testing, you can achieve so much more. Uh, this is a daunting task to improve on a breed and to do it by yourself. And you've had dogs that you were able to use without actually owning yourself and make quick advances. And uh, so we can all look to you for ways of doing it and achieving it. So thank you again. We'll be in touch. We'd love to have you back on for another uh, session about different topics in the future. But have a great weekend, and thank you again. Thanks, Troy. Bye.